How's everybody today? Good? Very good, very good. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Aaron and uh, I'm part of the team here at Chosen Church. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Can we thank Wade for his wonderful pianoing? Thanks, buddy. You can head off. It's really good. Is everyone good? Some days, you know, some days, today's one of those days where like, like I always love being at church, but you know, like some days you're just like, man, this is good. You know, it's good to be with brothers and sisters. It's good to be with faith-filled people. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, amen? It's good to be in the house of the Lord. And God is everywhere, just like Liam said. But sometimes when we gather together, there's a sense. There's a sense of expectancy. There's a sense of faith in the air. There's a sense that God's going to do something that he's that he's going to change us, that he's going to renew something in our spirit. It's cool, right? It's cool. Today is a good, good day. It is an amazing season in the life of our church. Like, it's just incredible. Like, just God's moving, right? Like, God is doing stuff and impacting people. And, 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 and we're just seeing, oh, it's just mind-boggling. I just, it's too exciting to even talk about it. So, Good. We're seeing on, uh, during the week, we are opening the place up for prayer. <laughs> Shock horror. The church is open for prayer. <laughs> but we're literally making a point of making sure that here is open every day. You can come in, 9 o'clock in the morning. It's all set up, ready to go. There's people here to pray with you. You can come in and bring any need, any situation. You can bring a praise report. You can bring a request. It doesn't really matter. You can just come in and somebody's going to stand with you and pray with you. Or you can just come in and pray on your own. Just be in a quiet, safe place and uh, spend time with God. That's pretty special, right? Pretty special. After the service today, if it is your first time here, we do want to welcome you. Welcome. Can we just give them, those people, a warm round of applause? If it is your first time or you're relatively new, or maybe you've been coming for a while, but you want to know a little bit more, you want to hear a little bit more, you've kind of been sort of standing on the edge of the pool of church, dipping your toe in, thinking, I wonder what this is going to be like, and now you're like, you know what, this is okay, they're a bit weird, <laughs> but I can handle it. And they do that funny praying in tongues thing, and they kind of like all expect God to do something, so you know, it's, it's okay, right? But we've got this thing called Meet the Team. So after the service, you can gather together. You can ask some questions from some of our crew, right? So you kind of expect the dude up the front to tell you positive things and it's great to be part of and come on, be part of it, help us out. But meeting the actual people that are in it, doing it, right? That's, that's what you want to do. And be able to ask the questions, hey, what's it like to be part of this church? What's it like to be part of the team? What's it like in that dark room back with all this stuff going on? What are you guys doing over there? I'm sure they're doing something, you know, like this. That's the opportunity that you have to ask some questions, meet some of the team, find out about this connect group stuff. We talk about connect groups all the time because we're passionate about it. People are like, what are connect groups? That's weird. Well, essentially, it's just a group of friends getting together to talk about Jesus, talk about life, talk about um, challenges, talk about wins, uh, invest into each other, encourage one another, help each other. That's what connect groups are all about. Um, and we want you to be part of a connect group. Um, we have a myriad of different connect groups, uh, people meeting from ladies groups to uh, emerging leaders groups to anybody groups to... We've got a, a, a prison group. Yeah. Don't be in that one. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't join that one. No, I've been there. I tried that. It's good for a season, and then, you know, you want to get out of there. No, no, but we have all these different groups, um, and we see move, God move powerfully, like... Honestly, like speaking of um, Prison Alpha, it is next level. God is moving. We have a, a team of people who go into Casuarina Prison every week to share the gospel of Jesus. Now, we've got guys within that group. There's 12 of them. There's 12 disciples too in the Bible. Funny that, right? 12 of them in there who are now getting passionate because they're seeing God move. They're like, hang on, this isn't just a story. He's real. Jesus is real. And so now they're taking it back to the cell block. And they're running their own connect group. Yeah. That's what we want. Amen. That's what we want. 
They don't need some dude up the front telling them all about Jesus. They don't need that. They just say, hey, if you're real, come into my world, come into my life. And now they're sharing it with one another. That is amazing. Amen? We have, once a month, we have a men's group that meet for a barbecue. Everyone loves bacon. Whether you're into Jesus or not, bacon's good. <laughs> bacon's good. So they gathered together yesterday, they did that. Uh, and then we are starting on Monday nights at 7 p.m. here. On a Monday night is um, a, a men's group. Um, so that's this Monday, every Monday following, you can come along and be part of that men. Come along to that. <laughs> it's a men's group. Um, and then we also have another men's group on a Thursday at 10 a.m. 10 a.m.? 10 a.m. on a Thursday that also meets here. Uh, there's a ladies group on a Tuesday that 10 a.m. that meets here. Uh, and then there's a bundle of other groups that meet um, during the week at various houses and various places. Just get onto it. You want to be part of it. It's really cool. Great things happen in Connect groups. So definitely do that. And like I said, if you go to meet the team, you can find out a bit more about our Connect groups. There's a heap of birthdays uh, on at the moment, which is really, really cool. Love a good birthday. It means that God has saw fit to give you another shot at it. You get another go at it. Yesterday might have been just average, but he's given you another go. He's given you another go. So today's going to be better. I know that Adrian's got a birthday today, I reckon. It's got to be today. Um, little Harley. I don't know if Sam and that are here, but it's Harley's first birthday today. And it was very exciting. It feels like only yesterday, but we were celebrating her birth, and now she's one. That's really, really cool. Um, yeah, really cool. And it was on Facebook. So you're allowed to tell everybody things that are on Facebook, right? It's already public. So they're, they're Sam and Heinrich are um, having another child, their third child, which is really cool. And they just did this reveal thing, which was really, really exciting. Uh, I know that um, the wonderful Jeff has a birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday for tomorrow. Our good friend Peter's got a birthday this week. Uh, Olivia's got a birthday this week. And the wonderful Linda has a birthday this week too, 21 again. Beautiful. Very good. Um, and happy birthday to anybody else. If I'm not sure, it's because I don't have your birth date. That's why I'm not saying your name. So fill out a gold card and I'll say happy birthday. Gold card is the key. But happy birthday. Can we just give a round of applause to all those celebrating a birthday in the not too distant future? That'll be good. Um, like Liam said, we have got out. We're, we're, we are embarking on a journey to ensure that um, we have a facility that connects with community. Yeah. Our goal is not to just like be the, the chosen frozen, yeah. you know, these people who come together, it's our own little thing. It's actually we're here to, be, to impact our community in a positive manner, right? We're here to be a light into a dark world. So we want to have this place open uh, for during the week for people just to come in, regardless of whether or not uh, they know Jesus. It's not, not our, it doesn't matter. They can come in, right? We'll tell them about Jesus. That'll be a thing that's going to happen. But uh, we want to open up. So we've got uh, a renovation. We're about to start with the cafe just fitting that out like so good. It's going to be really cool. Once we get that done, we're going to uh, do this big opening thing where we'll open up the gym. We built a gym in the church. A gym in the church. Cool, right? And, um, and obviously the playground, we're going to get some things all looking sweet and shiny and all of that. And do you know what the good news is? You'll be able to go to the gym. You'd be able to take your kids with you. Your kids can play, right? And it won't cost you a cent. You're just going to be able to come for free and hang out with good people, get fit, mind, body, and soul. It's going to be epic, right? So um, if you want to help with any of that stuff, let us know. If you've got some free time, we will put you to work. We will put you to work. Um, but like I said, we do, we do believe the church is a house of prayer, right? That God, God wants his house to be a house of prayer. It has to be um, the, the, the starting point, the foundation of all we do. And that's why we're opening the building up for prayer. That's why we're wanting to open up for everybody to be able to come in and pray. And um, a little while ago, God gave me this, this picture of what he is doing. Not going to do, but he's already activating and doing. And he gave me a little glimpse of what it is. And, um, and 
from when the two doors are open at the back um, and I'm standing up here, I can see through to the front door. You guys can't because you're sitting in the wrong place. But I can see through to the front door. And God gave me this picture during my prayer time of people coming through the doors, right? And they're coming through the front door and they're coming all the way in down to this front section. And we call this the altar. It's just the front of the room, really. But we call it the altar, right? Because we want to bring things to the altar. We want to lay it before the Lord. And so we kind of do it symbolically, I guess, in a way, down the front here. It's not more holy here than it is where you're sitting, but there's something about stepping out in faith. But this picture was people coming in. And the people coming in, there's people coming in in wheelchairs. But they were coming in, and when they got to here, the wheelchair stopped, and they were standing and worshipping God. People were coming in on crutches, but when they got into here, they dropped their crutches and walked forward and worshipped God. People were coming in with broken hearts because their children were lost and had gone off track and were on drugs and, and doing things they shouldn't be doing. And they came in here and their hearts were being mended and knitted back together where God was restoring them. People were coming in with addictions that were like chains wrapped over their shoulders. And as they got to the altar before the Lord, the chains came off. People were dragging ball and chain and they're trying to limp on in and drag this thing in, this thing that's holding them down, darkness, anxiety, and depression was holding them down. And as they came into the altar, the chains were breaking and they were walking free. This is what God wants to do. Not what Aaron wants to do. This is what God is doing. And we just have to be ready and obedient. Amen? He wants his house. The church is God's house. And he wants his, his house to be a house of prayer. We try and fix things with programs and with all of this stuff, and I'm not saying they're bad, they're good, they're just a tool we use. But the real power is in the power of prayer. Bring it before the Lord, and he'll do something amazing, amazing. So if you need prayer anytime, you can come here. We'll pray with you. We'll believe for a breakthrough, and then we're going to talk about the amazing things God does. Amen? Very good, very good. Next weekend is Father's Day. So it's going to be fun. It'll be fun for Father's Day. So bring your father, bring your father figure, bring someone, bring anybody. Just invite people. It's going to be good. We're going to have a lot of fun. Is that all right? Yeah. Father's Day. It's got a golf theme. If you've uh, got a golf outfit, you can wear your golf outfit. <laughs> I don't have a golf outfit, but I might try and wear a golf outfit. That could be fun. I <coughs> don't know what a golf outfit is. It's one of those funny hats. Anyway, we'll get into that later. But if you've got a golf outfit you want to wear, um, you, can, you can do that. Before I, um, before I get into what I had planned to speak about, um, I just really like, feel like God's got putting something on my heart that I want to share. It's really interesting, and it like, kind of goes with what we're talking about, house of prayer and how we want to open up and all this kind of thing. And even with the men's group a little bit, but um, but I read this uh, this verse the other day that caught my attention, um, and I just want to share it with you. It is in it is in Second Samuel, Second Samuel, Second Samuel twenty three, Second Samuel twenty three. Uh, and it's just really, really simple, but, but um, it caught my attention and I feel like it could be important and God might want us to think about it. Uh, verse 8. Verse 8. It says this. <laughs> These are the names of David's mighty warriors. Right? So it says, These are the names of David's mighty warriors. David was this incredible king. Um, amazing warrior. Uh, it says that he had a heart like God's. God loved him. He had a heart over un, unto his own heart. So like God. Um, he made lots of mistakes, which is really nice because so do I. Uh, but this is the names of David's mighty men, mighty warriors. Um, Josheb, with a long last name, we just call him Josheb, a Tachamanite was chief of the three, right? So there's sections of these 
uh, mighty warriors. And it says that he raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. 800 in one encounter. What does God want to say? Just one encounter can change everything. One encounter. No matter how big the odds. 800 to 1, pretty big odds. One encounter can change everything. You don't hear about this guy before this. You don't hear about it afterwards. He gets one sentence in the whole Bible. I'd be pretty stoked with one sentence in the Bible, amen? I'd be pretty chuffed with that. He gets one mention, but one encounter changed everything. He became one of David's mighty warriors through one encounter. Can I encourage you? One encounter. Sometimes that's the only thing we need to pray for. Lord, one encounter with you will change everything. One encounter with you will change it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We honour you. We glorify you. Lord, we want to hear from you this morning. We want to grow closer to you. Uh, We want to know you better. Lord, we want to not just know of you, but we want to know you. And we want you to impact our lives in tangible ways. We want to hear your voice. We want to sense your presence. We want to see you move. Lord, we want to experience all there is to experience. So, Holy Spirit, just flood this place. Have your way in here. Whatever needs to be broken off, break it off. Whatever needs to be laid down, Lord, we lay it down. We choose to open our hearts and our minds, incline our ear to you. We pray that you speak to us. Lord, less of me. Let this not be my time. Let this be your time. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Amen. I've got a, um, a short video that I want us just to watch. Cool, huh? We're in a series at the moment called Dare to Share. It's all about sharing our faith. It's all about telling people about Jesus which can be quite intimidating uh, and, and sometimes brings out insecurities in us when we have to think about sharing our faith, which leads me to the title of today's message, It's Not the Size That Counts. That will stick in your mind. It's not the size that counts. Even the little things that we do matter. The little things, this video shows us that we make these little decisions along the way that have an impact further than what we realise. Sometimes we are in our own little bubble and we think, there's nothing I could do to impact that massive problem. There's nothing I could do to change the world. There's nothing I could do to help anybody or do anything. But we really need to grab that even the little things, good and bad, they have an impact. They have an impact. Turn with me, if you can, to Zechariah 4. Zechariah 4, when you get there, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Zechariah 4. Verse 6, it says this. This is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. It is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Nothing, not even a mighty mountain, will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him. And when Zerubbabel sets the final stone of the temple in place... The people will shout, may God bless it, may God bless it. Then another message came to me from the Lord. Zerubbabel is the one who laid the foundation of this temple and he will complete it. Then you'll know that the Lord of heaven's armies has sent me. 
verse 10, do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. Small things matter. Sometimes we just have to start. Sometimes we just have to take a step. Sometimes we have to lay a foundation. This dude with a long bubbly name built a massive temple for God. But it started by laying a foundation. And it says that God rejoiced in the small beginning to see the plumb line in his hand. For those of you who don't know what a plumb line is, basically it's like a level, it's a line, they string, they pull it out, they make sure everything's flat and straight, and that's how they get their first line to start from. So before anything else has started, nothing, built nothing. So you're tasked with building a massive temple, massive. You haven't done it yet, but he rejoices to see that first beginning, that small thing, that start. And we never quite know where our decisions will lead us. But the small things matter. We often live our lives thinking that we have to do these mighty exploits, these massive things in order to make a mark, to to leave a legacy, to, to be set apart, to do anything of any significance. It has to be massive. But if you do any research into those people you think are doing massive exploits, it all started with very small habits. Just little things that they put in place first. And the truth is that everything we do matters. (coughs) It has an impact, good or bad. You think about when you drop a small stone into a lake, it has a ripple effect. What you do here will affect over there. There's nothing quite like being on your boat. I don't have a boat. I've got a dinghy, but I call it a boat. It sounds a lot better, right? It's nothing like cruising through the ocean in my boat. (laughs) (laughs) But then cruising along, and I know this sounds terrible, but but there's nothing better than cruising along in your dinghy, and you can see about 100 metres off to the side over there, um, a dude on one of those stand-up paddle boards. <laughs> ripped. They're always ripped. Muscly, glistening in the sunlight. Probably healthy, probably happy. All of that stuff. <laughs> you watch the waves. And then... They always do it like that. I don't know why. I don't know if that's necessary. But then the waves of your dinghy hit... <laughs> Sorry. (laughs) Not that I would do that. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. Back to the pebble. The pebble's better. (laughs) There's a ripple effect. The small things we do impact people, impact things, impact the world around us. And we need to get into our minds that it's not always the big exploits that are of most value. We think they are, but they all start with one small step, one step. Small pebble being dropped into the lake. The other day, uh, after school, I picked up my kids from school and uh, around the corner from our house, there's an a ice cream place, a gelato place. And I took the kids for ice cream because um, I'm a good dad and I love them. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with my attraction to ice cream. <laughs> so what would you like? You can have anything you like, have whatever you want. And, uh, and they get their ice creams and I'm sitting at this, they've got these tables out the front, we're sitting there, it's a nice day and uh, I'm looking over at my son Levi who's an incredibly handsome young man and he's sitting there with this uh, waffle cone and you know when they overload it, which is something like I always like that even though it drips everywhere, <laughs> like, it's like I got my money's worth and my money's worth is on the floor. <laughs> he's got this massive waffle cone this big, and it just looked amazing, like just this amazing ice cream. I think it was tiramisu flavor or something, just really good. He's sitting there and he said, so we're talking and chatting about the day and we're grateful for what good happened today and the kids are eating their ice cream, it's great. And then like, 
and he's gotten about halfway through it and he's like, oh. I'm like, what? And he goes, it's a hair. <laughs> a red hair. Nothing against redheads. There's a hair in his ice cream. Comparative to the size of the ice cream, the hair was very small. Really insignificant. However, when you have a hair in your ice cream, no matter how good that ice cream tastes, it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Amen? Amen. The smallest thing can ruin something amazing. Something amazing. So he did what any good price man would do. Waste not, want not. You did the right thing. <laughs> Get your money's worth. One small negative action can have a mighty impact. There's a story, true story, I want to tell you about. about it happened in the early 1800s. There was this pastor by the name of Reverend Robert James. He had a church in Texas. Amazing communicator, great church, doing amazing things, powerful. Uh, he had two sons, two boys, uh, and, and he was uh, a, a dedicated pastor uh, and he knew that he wasn't spending quite enough time with his kids. He wanted them to have fun and have something that they could do and all of that. And they wanted a dog, right? So they kept asking him for a dog. Uh, and he was like, well, we can't really afford it. I don't want to spend our money on that, having a dog, all of this kind of thing. He felt a bit bad saying no to them all the time because, you know, he'd be at work a lot and, and they'd be sort of playing and they wanted to do more and this was before we had Nintendo and all of that stuff. That's showing my age, isn't it? Nintendo. <laughs> Whatever the kids are playing these days. So he's like feeling a bit bad about it. And one day, this dog comes running onto their yard at home through the front gate, comes running in, and he sees this dog, beautiful dark black coat, no collar, what's the luck? So this dog's friendly, they feed the dog and they get it some water and all of that, and he looks, there's no collar, no tag, no nothing on it. The kids love the fact that the dog's there. And then he goes, well, we can't find its home, we'll just sort of look after it. After a day or two, he goes, okay, boys, new dog, this is your dog. So they named the dog, lovely, it's great. This dog was remarkable, beautiful black coat and uh, this really distinct white spot on its tail. Right? So they love this dog. Another couple of days go by and then uh, Reverend Robert James starts to notice in town these posters. Lost dog. You'll know him by the white dot on his tail. So this is a problem now because the good reverend is thinking of his children and how they've become attached to this dog now. They've named it, they're looking after it, they're playing with it, they're loving this dog. He's like, how can I now take the dog away from them? That's going to hurt my kids and we wanted a dog and now we've got a dog and all that. So he comes up with the only possible answer that you could come to as a good reverend. Get out some dark paint and paint that white spot. <laughs> So he does this, he paints the white spot on the dog's tail. A few days later, the owner is going from door to door because he loves his dog and he wants to find his dog. So he's going door to door through the town, saying, hey, have you seen my dog? I'm trying to get my dog back. He's giving out flyers, he's got a bundle of these flyers, lost dog, white dot on the tail. Gets to Reverend Robert James's house, knocks on the door. The good Reverend opens the door, his boys, you know, when they knock on the door, your, your attention goes, oh, who could that be? You're not expecting visitors. So the boys are standing, peeking down the corridor. They can see and hear everything that's going on. He answers the door. He goes, hi, uh, have you seen my dog? Before he can get the words out, this is a true story, before he can even get the words out, this dog recognises a voice and comes running. Goes to the front door where its real owner is standing and he looks down and sees his dog, and he's elated. Ah, oh, it's my dog, it's my dog, it's my dog, my lost dog. Well, the good reverend 
quick thinking, nimble on his feet, intelligent man, clever man, says, can you show me one of those flyers? Pulls out one of the flyers. He goes, bah, yeah, no, unfortunately, this isn't your dog. This says your dog's got a white spot on its tail. No white spot on the tail. The actual owner of the dog has a look. Well, mustn't be my dog. My dog's got a white spot on the tail. It looks like my dog, but it's not. And it takes a little while for the good reverend to convince this man that it's not his dog. Because obviously anybody who's a dog owner knows their dog, right? Stand there looking at you, all of that kind of thing. Up and away. And man, this guy gives, uh, you know, just deception of deception. Just like manipulates the situation. Outstanding influence on this guy. Just gets him to the point where he's like, so sorry for bothering you. I, I should never have come. Sorry to cause you any stress and problems. Da, da, da backs away and leaves. The kids watch this whole thing. Now, this wasn't the first time that these two boys had seen their dad speak. He was a preacher. They had seen their dad's best sermons. They had seen him speak about lots of things. But this one was different. This one stuck with them more than any other speech their dad had ever made. The way that he was able to convince this man that it wasn't his dog. This masterful manipulation, this powerful persuasion, this dynamic deception, the kids watched these two boys. In the memoirs of Reverend Robert James, it said, that day, we kept the dog, but I lost my sons. When you follow the history through, his sons were Frank and Jesse James, the notorious criminals that went on to do so much crime and destruction for the United States. They were cheating people, robbing people, robbing banks. And their dad, the good Reverend Robert, attributes it to that moment when he lost his son. One seemingly insignificant moment in all of life changed a whole lot for his family. What we do matters. What we do matters. The little things matter. Our integrity matters. It really matters. We must be so intentional We've got to be so aware that what we do when we think no one is watching, we need to get it into our minds that that matters because it becomes who we are. Now, this is a struggle for all of us. I'm not going to stand here and say that I've got it all down pat. In fact, most of the things I speak about are things that I'm wrestling with myself. The best uh, the best explanation of a sermon that I've ever heard um, is that, wrestle, uh, that, that sermons are not to be agreed with or disagreed with, they're to be wrestled with. So for us to back and forth over. The struggle is real. So question. This is a serious one. When you go shopping and you're in a hurry... You've been into the shops, you've got all your items and you come out to the car and you load your car, do you take the trolley back to the trolley thing? <laughs> Question. When you see a piece of rubbish in the car park when you're coming into church, you see it on the floor over there, do you just... Walk past it, or do you pick it up? And I know what you're saying. No, no, I'll pick it up, unless it's a tissue. <laughs> if it's a tissue, I'm not picking it up. That's somebody else. I did it this morning. That's why that one came to mind. I came in, and the car, I think Nani was in the car park, and there was one tissue. 
And it was like in the corner. And I walked in, I saw it there. And I kind of like went. <laughs> Came in. <laughs> I was up in my uh, upstairs for about half an hour. And it just plagued me. <laughs> I was being tormented by a tissue. <laughs> At the end of it, I went, fine. Got up, went downstairs, picked up the tissue. <laughs> anyway. Question. Question. Are you always late? Like, not like super late. Like, not like, oh, I rolled up an hour late. Like, are you just like always five or ten minutes late? Of course, you tell everybody and yourself that there's a reason. And it's an important reason. But the truth is, you just didn't prioritise where you're going. The truth is, you wanted a bit more sleep. The truth is, you're on your phone watching reels. <laughs> oh, is that how much time's gone by? Question. Do you tell people about Jesus every day? Now, of course, I know why you don't. Because you don't want to be rude. You don't want to force your beliefs on somebody else. Or maybe you're just scared. Maybe you're worried about what they're going to think of you. Maybe you're worried about how you're going to look. Maybe you're worried that what you say might sound stupid. Maybe you're so wrestling with your own faith that it almost makes it impossible for you to share it with somebody else. But as soon as you get around Christian family, praise the Lord. Just a question. Just thinking through these things. We often worry about what people think. But again, I think we need to worry more about what God thinks than we need to worry about what people think. <coughs> Here's a question. Rhetorical. Take it home with you. Do what you will with it. Do you tithe? Mm. Luke 16, verses 10 to 12 says, if you are faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with true, the true riches of heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own. Little things matter. Little things matter. There's this great story that I heard about this um, multi-millionaire. Oodles of money. And he decides to build another house. He wants his house built for him. He's got five houses already. And he wants another house built. So he finds uh, a builder. And he doesn't go to like the top echelon of the biggest building companies and all of that. He, he finds a guy who's working for himself. And he finds this guy who's been through a bit of hardship and a tough season because, of course, COVID hit. And then, we, you know, it's hard to get materials and all of that. Business is so hard. So he finds this dude and he says to him, um, I've already got five places, but I'd like you to build me a sixth house and the, the guy's like okay well what do you want to spend on it you know so i can give you a quote and blah, blah blah he's not spare no expense i want this thing the best like the best i don't want you to 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 skimp on anything i want like er, absolutely everything needs to be top notch the timber that you use i want it to be top grade timber the plumbing that you use, I want it to be the best. I want this thing to be top of the range. Every fixture, every fitting, every item in the house, I want it to be top level, top of the range, best, most expensive, all of that. 
this is what he says to the builder. And the builder's like, thinking to himself, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Have that sort of money. He goes, do you want me to let you know before I build or before I put all the stuff in? And the millionaire says, nah. How about it? Whatever you reckon, the best. I want the best. The builder's like, wow. That'd be great, wouldn't it? And then the millionaire says to the builder, he says, I'm going to go on holiday. You just build the place. You've got open access, as much money as you need. I'm going to be back in mm, 10 months. I'll be back in 10 months. I'm just going to go on a trip. The builder's like, no, oh, yeah, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? 10 months traveling around the world, five houses already, you want a sixth. And you're going to spend no expense. It's going to have expensive everything, expensive taps, expensive bench tops. Just whatever you want, just spend it. That must be lovely. You've got all this extra money. How can you live in six houses, never alone five? He doesn't say it to the guy, obviously, but this is what he's thinking. Because I can't even afford to pay my rent. The sink you want costs more than my house. So he goes, right, I'll build it. Pocky Moonair goes off, travelling around. And the builder decides that he's going to cut corners. Still charge the premium rate. Still charge that amount. But just use whatever timber. Just use cheap products. He won't know. He won't even be here half the time. It won't even matter. I'll make it look nice. It'll look nice on the outside. But underneath it'll be cheap. And I will have made all this extra money. It'll be great. Ten months pass. Place is finished from the outside. It looks amazing. The owner gets back and he's like, wow. This is wonderful. It looks fantastic. I trust that you did, like, spared no expense. I know that the bank balance went down a lot, so you obviously got premium everything. He was like, yeah, 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 premium everything. Then he says to the millionaire, he goes, why do you even want it? Not here, 10 months of the year. It's the sixth house. What are you doing? Why, why do you? The multimillionaire says, you know what? God's been really good to me. God's blessed me with favour, with opportunity, with wealth, influence. And so I thought I would use my wealth and my influence and opportunity to build this amazing house. And I wanted to pick someone to build it for me that I thought would really understand the merit of putting the best into it and I did my research and I know that you've been struggling for a long time so I wanted you to build me the best house ever so that I could give it away I'm giving it to you all of a sudden the realisation came across the builder <laughs> that rather than working with integrity he looked for a quick win and he robbed himself in the process. He robbed himself in the process. Sometimes the small things really matter. The unseen things really matter. The scripture that we started with from Zechariah tells us that God is pleased with the small beginning. It pleases him to see the plumb line, the level the first shovel, the first step, the first word, the first act. It pleases God to see that. We spend a lot of time trying to cut corners to get an instant benefit. In Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15, it tells us, catch all the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyard. What we do matters. One negative small act has a ripple effect. But on the flip side of that, one small positive action also has an extremely powerful impact. 
Dr. J. Edwin Orr is arguably one of the greatest authors on revival that has ever been. Church lecturer, uh, sorry, revivalist, writing about revival in churches and lecturing at colleges and all sorts of stuff. Very intelligent man. And when he was at Wheaton College, he took uh, a group of students. This is in 1940. He took a group of students to visit England. And they went to visit the Epworth Refectory. And that's where John Wesley was based. And beside the bed, which was John Wesley's room, where he stayed, there was two worn impressions in the carpet. And it said that that's where John Wesley would spend hours kneeling and praying for revival. Hours and hours and hours. So much so that it left impressions in the carpet. After the tour had been, and as they were getting back onto the bus to go back, Dr. J. Edwin Orr noticed one of the students was missing. So he went back upstairs and he found one of the students kneeling in that very place. He had his head in his hands as he kneeled. And he was just saying over and over and over again, Lord, do it again. Bring revival. Do it again. Do it again. Pray, pray over and over again. Dr. J. Edwin Orr walked over to the student, gently put his hand on his shoulder and he said, come on, Billy, we've got to go. Billy got up and walked back to the bus and they went back on their way. That Billy was Billy Graham, arguably one of the most influential evangelists of our time, if not history. Healed in the spot, a seemingly small act. Do it again. Do it again. Bring revival. Now, I'm not saying that was the only moment for Billy Graham. But boy, was that a moment. I'm not saying that was the only positive action that made a difference. But if it's possible, it is worth a try. Something that seems so small can have such an impact. Interestingly enough, we as a church do things all the time that maybe we don't give enough attention to and don't think are very significant. But just recently, we did a campaign called Heart for the Homeless. We do it every year. Because we do work out in the community, shower trucks and feeding programs and things like that to help less fortunate people. And often, when you're asked, oh, could you help out and just maybe go and get something to make a difference? You get a toothbrush for a homeless person. You're like, I can do that. It's not really going to do much, is it? Well, I'd argue that it can do quite a lot. It can make a huge difference. An absolutely massive difference. In fact, we got a thank you, tailored thank you to us, because we partnered with Sunshine FM, the radio station, and they sent us a thank you. And I think we can play it. Can we play that thank you? Hey, it's Becky Jazil here from Sunshine, and we just want to say a massive thank you. Thank you for partnering with us for Heart for the Homeless 2023. Now, we can proudly say that with your help, we managed to collect over 10,709 items for those that really need it. So from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much, Chosen Church. Thank you for opening your doors and partnering with us for Heart for the Homeless 2023. We look forward to partnering with you again next year. Thank you. Thank you.
a toothbrush. Well, it was one of 10,700 toothbrushes, bits and pieces that went, that actually go to helping somebody. The ripple effect is huge. It's huge. Matthew 13, 31 through 33 is Jesus talking. He's using parables to explain what he's trying to get across to make it sink in. He says, here's another illustration, right? It's another illustration that Jesus used. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree and birds come and make nests in its branches. Tiny seed becomes somewhere that life begins. Jesus also used this illustration. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she put only a little yeast into three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. The tiniest of things has a massive impact. Imagine if the small thing you prompted to do was actually directly for Jesus. Directly. See, we minimize the small thing because we think it doesn't have value. But what if it was directly for Jesus himself? Imagine that. Would that change how you approach things? Matthew 25 Verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He'll sit upon His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in His presence and He'll separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll place the sheep at His right hand and the goats at His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, come, come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones who have been put to the right will, they'll say to him, they'll reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did to one of the least of these brothers of mine, you were doing it to me. Whatever we do to the least of these, we're doing it unto Jesus. Little things matter. It's not the size that counts. Little things matter. We need to be sharing the good news of Jesus. We need to be telling people what is available to them. Even in small ways, you don't have to preach sermons or find a big platform. Simply invite someone to church. Simply ask them, how are you in Jesus? Simply extend a hand of grace or mercy to help somebody in a season of need. Small things make a massive difference. A while ago I had a dream and in the dream I had a dream my brain looked a bit weird it was all, I won't tell you what the dream was because I can find it but anyway I had this dream and in the dream I had a dream and I woke up twice in fact and I was kind of like Lord what are you trying to say here so I started to research this idea about a dream in a dream I found this poem, and in the 24th stanza of this poem, 
It says, is all that we see or seem a dream within a dream? I know that sounds kind of, what's he talking about? <coughs> Saved. I gave my heart to Jesus. I was broken. I was lost. I was in a dark place. I felt hopeless and useless and just unworthy of anything. Then I had an encounter, one moment, one moment with Jesus where I experienced his goodness. One moment where I experienced his love. One moment where I experienced his welcoming in. One moment that I truly felt accepted. One moment where all the things I had done were being pushed away, were being forgiven. One moment of genuinely feeling accepted. And I remember in the following days, daydreaming about sharing what I had received because it was so good, so overwhelming, so amazing. I found myself daydreaming about having an opportunity to tell other people about Jesus. I would find myself sitting in, I got saved in prison. I found myself sitting in my prison cell dreaming about the day I get out. And when I get out of here, I'm going to tell people about Jesus. I dream about that. A while later, a year or two later, I got out of jail. And I started to live out that dream. I started to get to tell people about Jesus. And as I was living out that dream of telling people about Jesus, I had another dream. And I dreamed that maybe one day, one, just one day, maybe, maybe I could dedicate my whole life to telling people about Jesus. Maybe one day I could get off the tools, I could break free from my past. Maybe one day I'd be in a position where I could actually dedicate my every single day to being a pastor and leading a church of Jesus Christ. Maybe 10 people might come and I could tell 10 people. Just maybe that was my dream. That was the dream. I was already living the first dream. And then sometime later, I was living that dream. And now I was living a dream in a dream. Because I was only living something that I couldn't even have dreamt right at the beginning. That small beginning. And it started with sharing with one person. Then I had a dream that one day I might be able to share the good news of Jesus and what he's done in my life with hundreds of people. And maybe, just maybe, if God saw fit, just maybe, just maybe, if he wanted to bless me enough and I was sitting in the right place at the right time and the wind blew across at the right time and the keys were just right, just maybe I might have an opportunity to lead an amazing church of warriors that would be counted, that would be counted in the book of life, that would dare to face odds like 800 to 1 and take a chance in one moment that could change everything. That's a dream within a dream within a dream. Because I'm living that. Now I dream now I dream. I am a dreamer. Because God is good, amen? God is good. I dare you to share. To share your faith. I dare you to dream about what could be. Because there was no way on earth, no possible way on earth, that 20 years ago, sitting in a prison cell, that I would ever have been able to stand here and share this story with you. It's a dream in a dream in a dream. 
But that's what God wants to do for us. And it starts with one small step in the right direction. One level foundation. One good decision. Knowing that that pebble, when you drop it, has the potential to impact your future, either for the good or for the bad. And it doesn't matter how big your pebble is because it's not the size that counts. It's positive or it's negative. And God wants you to be living out a dream, in a dream, in a dream. So I dare you to dream. I dare you to share. I dare you to invite someone to church. I dare you to put your wildest expectations in the hands of the Lord Almighty. No matter how impossible it seems, no matter how outlandish it feels to even think about, I dare you, I dare you. And whatever that is, whatever you're dreaming, whatever you're believing, whatever you're hoping for, we at Chosen Church will stand with you. We'll believe with you. We'll pray with you. We'll promote you. We will send you to wherever it is God is leading you. Because that's what we're here for. Amen will impact this city, this country, this world for Jesus Christ. Amen? If we can all just close our eyes for a second. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. If we can just Close our eyes just for a moment. And just try and tune yourself in to God. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for 50 years or five minutes or you haven't even made a decision yet. Just try and tune in to what God's doing. Just here now. Push aside any distractions. And just be open to what might say to you. If you're here this morning and you've been hearing what I'm saying, you're thinking, oh man, I want to live a life where I can dream. I'm not even worried about the dream in a dream. I just want, I just want to dream. It doesn't even have to come to pass. I'm just in such a place in my life that even being able to dream would be good. If you're here this morning, you've been listening to what I'm saying and you know that you need to put God on the throne of your life, that the way you've been doing it hasn't been working, you've been trying, you've been wrestling, you've been attempting, but it just you just don't have that fulfillment you know is there for you. Then with nobody looking around, like I said, everyone's eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, if the Holy Spirit is impacting you right now, there's something going on in your spirit, and you know you need to make a decision today to put Jesus first, then I'm just going to ask you just to raise your hand where you are. No one's looking around. I'm not going to call you out the front or anything. Yeah, I see that hand. So good. And I see that hand over there as well. And that hand there, well done. And that one there, so good. So good. Yeah, and I see that hand there too. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I see that hand there as well. Thank you, Jesus. So good. Is there anyone else? He longs for a relationship with you. He longs for an opportunity for you to enjoy his company. calling you by name into a relationship with him that will change your eternity. It will change everything. It will change everything. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are just so overwhelmed with gratitude. Your kindness immeasurable your grace 
it's unfathomable. You just can't even comprehend how good it is. <laughs> Lord, for the people today that bravely made a decision to put you first in their lives from this moment on, Lord, I pray a blessing upon them. Lord, I pray that you speak clearly to them. Lord, I pray for protection over them. Lord, we are so excited to see people make a decision for you. And Lord, we know that this is just the beginning, that making the decision is that first little pebble that gets dropped into the pond. But those ripple effects, oh, they're epic. They are absolutely epic. We thank you, Lord. Lord, together, we acknowledge our need for you. Together, we acknowledge that we've tried it our way and it didn't work. We've tried it the world's way and it didn't work. So we choose to try it your way, to honour you and to glorify you and to put you first. We ask that you speak clearly to each one of us, Lord, that you direct our steps, that you be the lamp unto our path. Lord, we choose this morning to believe that you sent your son so that we could have a relationship with you to redeem us, to forgive us, and to restore us back into right relationship with you. So today we choose to walk in that freedom. We take off shame, we take off condemnation, and we walk in the freedom and grace that you pour out for us. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, I pray a blessing over every single person here. And Lord, just an amazing blessing of grace on those who boldly made a decision today. Lord, may you be glorified through their lives. May you be lifted high. May you be honoured. And may you work powerfully in and through them. In the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Can we give God a clap of praise? All heaven rejoices when one person makes a decision to follow the Lord. Imagine what heaven's like when seven or eight people make a decision for the Lord. Woo, that's a party, amen? That's a party. That is so good. Now, can I encourage you, if you're one of those people this morning, don't just leave it there as a decision. Oh, yeah, that's cool. It's all over. That's one pebble. But, man, if you can throw a boulder, imagine that ripple effect. We've got a, a, a baptism information session coming up very soon. Uh, baptism is kind of like the, one of the things that we do next step, if you will. But we don't just say, hey, put your name down for it. Just do it. What we say is come and talk with us. Learn a bit about it. What is it? What's the next thing? What can I put in my life to really, really hook on to what God wants to do. So um, grab a gold card, put your name on that, uh, and we'll let you know about uh, our info session. Uh, don't forget we've got Meet the Team as well. Get activated, get or get connected, be part of what we're doing. God is doing amazing things in the life of this church, and the church is the people. It's you, and He wants to work in and through your life. Cool, right? Very cool. Hey, if you need prayer for anything at all, uh, if you've got questions, you you just want someone to stand with you and pray for you. Maybe you don't even know what you need prayer for. You just want someone to pray. You just feel like, hey, somebody needs to pray for me. Then we've got people ready to pray for you now. And we're also open Tuesday, 9 a.m., Wednesday, 9 a.m., Thursday, 9 a.m., Friday, 9 a.m. We're here ready to pray with you. Uh, and if you want to come in, just sit. Whatever you want to do, you can do that and connect groups, all of that stuff. Cool? All right. I'm going to release you because I've been talking for a really long time. Uh, and so you probably need to get out there and have a coffee or get to meet the team or something. But go and see someone, encourage them, tell them how good Jesus is because Jesus is good. Amen. Have an amazing week.